The last area I'd like to discuss in the context of excited electronic states is solvent achromism. And so I've actually shown this slide before in the context of talking about how important solvation effects can be. So you recall that the beta-ene dye, which is called ET30, when dissolved in different solvents has different colors, uh, that is the solvents take on a different color, reflecting that the dye is absorbing photons of different frequencies as it goes from its S0 ground state to its S1 first excited state. So I showed you pictures in methanol and isopropanol and acetone, and uh, this is a different laser dye now in fluorescence mode, but again, uh, the only difference between the vials being what solvent it's, it's dissolved in. So clearly the solvent interacting with either the ground state or the excited state or both is influencing the energy that separates the two. Now I'd like to look at the physics that sort of uh, rationalizes those interactions and also emphasize the difference between equilibrium and non-equilibrium solvation, where the latter plays a key role in solvent achromism. And so in the absence of a solvent, the frequency of photon that would be absorbed is given by Planck's relationship that the energy separating the two electronic states, I'll use GS for ground state and a star for an excited state, delta E is going to be equal to Planck's constant times nu. And using our usual picture of salvation sort of creating a new potential energy surface that has the same coordinates as the old but it is, that is somehow coupled to a surrounding medium, we might have that the ground state is pulled down here and its minimum is shifted a bit. And in solution, it's also stabilizing, sorry, in, in the excited state, it's also stabilizing, but it shifts the minimum over here. And in the end, we've got this energy separation. So in solution, we'll have a different frequency. And so if I look at those two differences, here was the amount of free energy gain from interaction with the solvent in the ground state. And here it is, it's from here to here in uh, sorry, this is actually the, the delta G difference in the, uh, in the absorptions, so a smaller amount here, then you'll get that the solvent achromic effect, which is the difference in the solvation of the excited and ground states, will tell you how the energy of absorption and solution differs from that in the gas phase. And just to come back to why is it, why is it this separation here, and not the difference between these two minima. And that's because the absorption is instantaneous, right? It comes from the geometry of the ground state, and before there can be any geometric relaxation, it intersects the excited state surface. And we've already seen that when we talked about the, the Frank-Condon rule for which vibrational uh, states will be accessed in an excitation. And so we're looking at uh, this change in the ground state, but only this change here in the excited state. Incidentally, if we were to wait long enough in the excited state prior to emitting a photon, then we would indeed relax. So the excited state would now come to its minimum. It would emit a photon vertically so that it would now hit a higher energy point on the ground state surface. And the difference between the absorbed photon and the emitted photon, that's known as the Stokes shift. So inevitably, you will emit a photon that is more red than the one that you absorbed because you will have dropped the energy of the excited state and raised the energy of the ground state through this geometric relaxation. Well, now let's talk about the reaction field that's involved here and the difference between equilibrium and, and non-equilibrium solvation. So remember when we talked about solvation, a way to think about it, this is the ground state self-consistent reaction field. Imagine that all of these surrounding strange arrowy things are solvent molecules. And the two arrows are meant to indicate their electronic distribution, that's the little arrow, and their nuclear distribution, if you will, the extent to which the polarity of the molecule depends on the orientation of the molecule. So if this were water, for instance, oxygen has lone pairs that are at one side of the atom compared to the OH bonds, and that gives rise to a, a net polarity. And unless you reorient the molecule, you will not reorient those lone pairs, although you can polarize them potentially. And so when we 
run a self-consistent reaction field calculation, we minimize the sum of the gas phase Hamiltonian, that's the electrons and the nuclei interacting with each other, the interaction of the charge distribution of the solute with the surrounding medium, and we pay a potential cost to organize the medium relative to being unorganized, homogeneous, and not responding to an internal uh, charge distribution. So what happens in the excited state? Well, we instantaneously, that is on the electronic time scale, go up to psi star, an excited state, and so I've put the self-consistent here, SC, in quotes, because on that time scale, the only thing I have time to be self-consistent with is the electronic degrees of freedom. And so you see all the little arrows have moved, the big arrows have not. So if I take advantage of uh, sort of a poor man's animation here and go back and forth, you see the big arrows aren't moving. The water molecules haven't had time to reorient, but the electrons, they can polarize in response to the electron moving to get to the excited state, if you want to think of it that way. So there are actually two different macroscopic quantities that are involved in this response to the excited state. There's the bulk dielectric constant, and that's, that's a measure of, at equilibrium, how well can a solvent tolerate separated charge. And then N is the index of refraction, and it is basically a measure of at infinite frequency, which is to say on an electronic or a photonic time scale, uh, how well can the solvent respond to charge movement? And so most organic solvents will have an N on the order of about hmm, 1.4. It's pretty close to the square root of 2. And uh, N squared, in fact, is a value that is analogous to a dielectric constant. And so that's why most nonpolar solvents have dielectric constants of 2, because really they have no orientational uh, component to their ability to stabilize charge. They're alkanes, for instance. It's, it's terribly minor. But they do have electrons, and it's the electrons responding to charge distributions that makes them solvents. But in any case, this is a non-equilibrium quantity. We're not allowing the solvent to fully relax. We're only allowing the electronic part of the solvent to relax. So if you think about how you might try to put that together from a sort of computational standpoint, if you remember the generalized Born model that tells you about the polarization free energy, so that's the coupling between the charge distribution of the solute and that of the solvent. In the ground state, it had a relatively simple form. Here was how it depended on the dielectric constant. And then you could think of it as being the atoms of the solute interacting with a field generated in the solvent that, of course, depends on the charge distribution of the solute. So that's why the charges of the atoms appear again. And then there was this gamma thing that had units of 1 over R and sort of the right limits. And that's how we did self-consistent reaction field for the ground state. When you get to the excited state, it's a little more complicated. So the easiest term to think about is just the electronic response, because that really is an equilibrium response. So it looks, for the excited state, looks just like the ground state, except we're going to use N squared instead of epsilon. And it involves the charges of the excited state and the field created by the charges of the excited state. But the difference is that only part of the solvent is involved in the response. In the meantime, there is also the new charges interacting with the leftover part of the ground state reaction field. So this is no longer 1 minus 1 over epsilon. We've got the electronic response up here, but everything after the electronic response, so that's the 1 minus 1 over n squared minus 1 over n squared minus 1 over epsilon, so those will drop out. That leftover stuff is the new charges interacting with the old reaction field for the slow part. And then you have to pay a cost in order to orient your reaction field and finally, the, now that there are two reaction fields, they actually interact with one another, and you can think of that as adding a cross term to the whole thing. And so, of course, this I, I know this looks rather imposing, and uh, I really want people to focus on the, the uh, qualitative aspects of these two different response rates and the complexity that that introduces. If you want a lot more gory detail, you could go read these references. So just to give you a feel then for how you might implement this in an excited state formalism within, say, CI singles. So we have our wave function for the excited state is a linear combination of singly excited determinants. 
And so I'll actually index the ground state by one here, and then all the higher states involve singly excited determinants relative to the ground state. Well, we would do the usual thing that you form a CI matrix and diagonalize it, except that now the Hamiltonian is not just the gas phase Hamiltonian, but there's this interaction term. And so within a, uh, an INDO model, it turns out that you can write the interaction term in this way, and it involves charges and, and distances as, as we expect, and there's an excited state charge and a ground state charge, because those are the reaction fields. This is the excited state reaction field, this is the ground state reaction field. And I don't want to go into the gory details of uh, actually computing matrix elements, but just to indicate that an interesting feature of this, of course, is that this interaction term is different for every state. Right? Because the first excited state will have one set of charges, the second excited state would have a different set of charges, the third excited state, and you get the picture. So if you want to solve this, you actually have to pick which of these interaction Hamiltonians you'll use, and it becomes increasingly self-consistent, because where do you get these excited state charges? Well, you get it from having the excited state wave function. So one will have to iterate through this process just the way you do for a, a ground state self-consistent reaction field. So here's just a, a simple example for the case of acetone. So in acetone, you can look at the solvatochromic effect on the end of pi star transition. So here's the gas phase absorption, and these are expressed in wave numbers now. So experimentally, it's 36,165 wave numbers to go from end to pi star state. And this is this vertical electrostatic model I just showed on the last slide, a generalized Born model, for a series of solvents expressed as a shift relative to the gas phase. And so a positive number in this case implies a red shift, and that's just by convention. So it's easier to hit the excited state, and a negative number implies a blue shift. A blue shift means that the ground state is stabilized by solvation more than the excited state. And so one thing you see is that the, the vertical electrostatic model predicts always that the ground state is better solvated than the excited state. And one actually expects that. Uh, one expects it because we're only really considering electrostatics so far. You're in equilibrium with the ground state. You're not in equilibrium with the excited state. And n to pi star is not generating some enormous dipole, for instance, that can have a great excitation, uh, a great interaction rather with the solvent. Uh, the other thing you notice is, so in addition to getting the sign wrong here, uh, there's no distinction between, say, acetonitrile and water with the computational model, but there's a big distinction in experiment. And so that suggests that there's probably some specific interaction, and I, it won't take long to think about it and say, wow, I, I bet that might be hydrogen bonding, because acetonitrile doesn't do that, but water does. So what about the redshift? What's responsible for the redshift in a nonpolar solvent? So arguably, that is actually a dispersion effect. So you remember our old friend dispersion. When you go to an excited state, by taking an electron and putting it into what's generally a more diffuse orbital, you would expect your solute that's been excited to be more polarizable. It has less tightly held electrons. And remember, the more polarizable you are, the more favorable your dispersion interactions with surrounding molecules. So if you take that vertical electrostatic model and adjust it empirically with two things, you say, well, I am going to pick a universal constant, call it capital D, and this is how dispersion should go, and just take my word for it that it depends on the index of refraction, which tells you about the polarizability of the solvent molecules, um, and I optimize that value over the data for acetone. And I also invoke hydrogen bonding. Why would hydrogen bonding make a difference? Well, remember, that was an n to pi star transition. So if I'm actually hydrogen bonding to the lone pair, that makes it a lot harder to take away that electron in a lone pair and put it into the pi star. So we, st we would certainly expect that you should significantly blue shift the absorption by stabilizing the ground state by hydrogen bonding to the lone pair. Uh, which you don't get that kind of stabilization in the excited state. So again, we'll, we'll optimize a universal parameter. We'll multiply times a measure of hydrogen bond acidity for the solvent. So alpha is a solvent property and N squared is a solvent property here. And you can look up these values in physical organic textbooks. Water's got a strong alpha. Methanol's got a big alpha. Uh, and so when we do that, when we optimize, we get these two values. And let me just show you then what the, uh, what the data look like at that stage. 
So this is now electrostatics plus dispersion and hydrogen bonding. Here are the experimental numbers again, and here are the uh, EPDH values. So you see you do pick up the dispersion redshift with the very nonpolar solvents. You do pick up a significant distinction between ethanol, methanol, and water compared to acetonitrile, and you continue to do fine for, say, chloroform, which is uh, not terribly hydrogen bonding, nor is it terribly polar. And in fact, over these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine solvents, given those two uh, optimized parameters, the mean unsigned error is driven down to 65 wave numbers. So that's a, an indication that, you know, you really can capture all of the physics, although there's a little bit of empirical fitting involved here. All right, well, we've covered excited states uh, in general. We've covered them uh, from a computational standpoint and a conceptual standpoint. And finally, we've considered the effects of a surrounding medium. So that's going to wrap up excited states. And we will have uh, not much left in the course at this stage. Uh, we're going to look at some kinetics and dynamics. And I will talk to you then.